Pianist Simona Dinerstein is one of the most commanding and compelling pianists performing today, renowned for her interpretations of Johann Sebastian Bach, like you just heard. She brings her warm sensibility and expressiveness to all performances. Performances on stages around the world from her acclaimed New York recital debut at Carnegie Hall's Vile Recital Hall in 2005. She has performed at venues such as London's Wigmore Hall, Vienna Concert House, Sydney Opera House, Seoul Arts Center, and tomorrow, Winnipeg's Westminster United Church with the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra. And Simona Dinerstein has joined me here in the Diamond Lane for a conversation ahead of that performance. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, it's such a pleasure to have you here in, in balmy Winnipeg in January. Well, I just think it's funny that you think it's balmy. Oh, it, it most certainly <laughs> is. I take it <laughs> I take it Brooklyn's a little warmer then. It, uh, it currently. is, yes. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, I just want to begin by saying how excited uh, I am for this event. I mean, not only does it, does it bring you to Winnipeg to perform with the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra, uh, but further, it, it features the Canadian premiere of a new Philip Glass work, the Piano Concerto No. 3, a work which he wrote specifically for you. I, I was wondering, could you just tell us a little bit about your relationship with, with Philip Glass and how this all came about? Uh, yes, it was really a, a very lucky chain of events. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Philip Glass invited me over for breakfast to his home. Hmm. And um, I guess he had been listening to my recordings or you know, he was interested in meeting me. And um, we had a really nice talk. And during that talk, we we discussed the possibility of him writing something for me. So that's where it all started. And then it was my idea to, to ask if he would be interested in writing a piano concerto for piano and string orchestra, because that's a combination that I really like, mm -hmm. and that there are, there's not a lot of repertoire for that combination since the Baroque period. So, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, I mean, again, to use that, that exciting term, uh, when we look at the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, for instance, the term that we apply is he, he was a great composer. And with Philip Glass, we get to say he is. So there is a collaborative aspect to, to this work then. Well, yes. I mean, I, I did get to see he shared the first movement with me after he finished it. But it certainly wasn't collaborative in the sense of me suggesting things <laughs> I wanted edit. him to do. No, <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't do that for yeah. sure. But it was very interesting. Once he finished the whole piece last July, I went in and played it for him. Uh, I tried to play the piano and the orchestra part for him. And uh, then after hearing me play it all the way through, he realized certain things that needed to be changed. And I've not really witnessed that before. I mean, I've, I've done commissions, I've worked with composers, but I've never sat next to a composer while they make major changes. And so, so it was quite interesting to see what he thought needed changing and how it needed to be changed. And, and uh, I, I really enjoyed being part of that process. And the, the process is an organic one, right? It's a living thing. Anytime we make music, and, and often we, we, we take a score that is existing, but like you said, when it's in its infant stages, mm -hmm. there's something so tender there and, and with something that has so much promise. Do you feel any kind of pressure associated with that at all, or is it just part of the whole process of music making to you? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think that the thing that's interesting about him as a composer is that he's also a performer. Mm -hmm. And because he's a performer, I think he realizes that the music really only exists while it's being played. Hmm. And, um, and because of that, he allows quite a lot of freedom to the interpreters. And I, would even, I even have gone so far as to ignore some changes that he made that I didn't agree with. Really? Uh, yeah, and, and he was okay with that. And uh, he also, like Bach, he leaves out a lot of um, expressive markings. So there's, there's not a lot of articulation markings mm -hmm. or, or dynamics or even tempo. Uh, he writes suggestions of metronome markings, but he doesn't think that they need to be taken literally. And um, so it's an interesting um, commonality between Bach and Glass that the performer has to make a lot of creative decisions. And because of that, if you hear different people play the same piece of music, it will sound quite different. 
Well, I want to speak to those differences a little bit more. Um, in 2007, you released your Goldberg Variations. And I, I wanted to just touch on that because um, in terms of that idea of having your own voice being felt, uh, looking back 10 years later down the line, uh, just over 10 years, in fact, you're still performing these works. Do you hear them and, and, and feel the need to, I guess they continue growing is basically what I'm asking, um, to, to jump back to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, who's of course also on uh, tomorrow's program is he somebody that you're still regularly performing and I mean obviously you are but oh yeah uh, I mean I am regularly performing box music and then I have actually been performing the Goldberg variations quite a bit this yeah. year because I've been doing a uh, collaboration with the a dance. choreographer yeah but um, <clears throat> yeah it's something that I've thought about a lot how does a piece change you know one, one thing I've thought about is like when you, you think about some of these uh, rock groups or <laughs> or singers like, you know, Leonard Cohen, how many times did he sing Suzanne, you know? Yeah. And um, did it change? Like, I, I think that things change and they also remain the same. I mean, it's still the same person doing it, but, but you know, the balance shifts in a way. So uh, the, I suppose uh, one of the last things I really want to touch on is um, tomorrow evening, um, the work that you're also going to be performing uh, of Johann Sebastian Bach. The concerto is one that you've performed before. Um, what What is for you the, the motivating factor behind Johann Sebastian Bach's music? What What do you find in it that is so unique? I mean, it's a question that we ask so many performers, but, but to you, what is it about his music? Well, I don't know if I can answer that yeah, in like no, a it's minute. A, it's a thesis. It's a thesis. It <laughs> but, really is. Uh, but I would say that to me it's the perfect balance between uh, the mind and the heart. That's what's so exciting about his music is that it's a perfect structure. Uh, everything about the composition is amazing. You know, the, the technique mm -hmm. that he had to write what he did. And yet it's something that's deeply human and about some the music speaks to something that's very profound so he's able to use this technique to reach a profound depth yeah th that level of profundity but at the same time uh, we always feel this this intellectual association with Johann Sebastian Bach we think of the math that's involved and, and everything else like that mm -hmm. but but like you said you each performer brings something unique and their own to his music which um, has really helped it to to, to live on as it has, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, I guess the reason why I ask is because the, the pairing of Philip Glass with Johann Sebastian Bach, we can draw a lot of parallels between their writing, like you were saying, with that idea of the uh, performer having their own interpretation of each work, the arpeggiated chords, the scalar passages, and everything mm -hmm. else. Looking at uh, into the future, let's say, I know, again, this is a, a large question, and there's a, a lot of um, hypotheticals involved. but. 250 years from now, what is it about uh, Philip Glass's music that makes it so so unique, so different? Hmm. Well, I think that he definitely created a new language. I mean, now his, his style of writing is something that we're very familiar with. Yeah. We hear it in movies. We hear it all over the place. 21st century you know? years. Yeah, but he started it. <laughs> and... Um, yeah. And he changed a lot of writing because of how he writes. Uh, I think that his music really reflects our time because it has a feeling of stillness and spareness, but also it's very emotional. Yeah. And I think that, that we're kind of, our lives are like that. You know, we're full of these patterns that, that repeat and yet, um, and yet we are, we can't get away from being human. You know, we, we're, we're surrounded by machines and computers and, and all of that, but, but it's humans operating them. And I think that, that his music has that kind of quality to it. Yeah, very much in the same way that um, Johann Sebastian Bach's music um, 
really is oh, that jumping off point for, for Western polyphony. It all goes back to Bach mm -hmm. and what he did. You, you're right. He kind of turned the page in a, in a new fashion. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come by the Classic 107 studio this afternoon, uh, Simona Dinerstein. It really is a pleasure to have you here. And you can see Simona Dinerstein performing tomorrow evening at Westminster United Church. Uh, she is going to be performing alongside the Manitoba Chamber Orchestra, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, as well as the Canadian premiere of Philip Glass Piano Concerto Number no. 3. For more information, visit the mco.ca.